There's a pride in the past and a, and a real pride for the future, too. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. It's a lot of work, too. I've been a parishioner 36 years. So you've seen, you've seen a lot of things happen. Right. Been through a lot of the history. I have missed many Sundays and so on at church since it's been there. I lived about 67 years, I guess, over on Isler Avenue. Well, it was just fields, fields, nothing but fields. The, where the church was, I mowed hay over there when I was 10, 12 years old. The fields of old, the past, our history, the beginning. It was really different then than what it is now. It was a old streetcar run out Third Street. Went out to, it was called Sennings Park then, over where Colonial Gardens is. It had a loop over there. It went out there and turned around and come back in. Cost seven cents to ride it. Best I can remember. When. It was many years ago when out of an open field, a field where hay once grew, a church and school were built. It was 1943 when construction began, and on February 22nd, 1944, a decree officially named St. Thomas More our patron saint. And uh, 400 years later, he was canonized as a saint in 1935. Well, this is a very troubled time in the country as well as in the world, getting ready for World War II. And so there weren't many parishes being built. So we're among the very first parishes to be called St. Thomas More. But uh, we've always had good priests here. Our first pastor was Father John Hannon. Father Hannon, he was a nice priest, but he was from Ireland or somewhere, I think. His father had, had bought this buffer, this floor buffer, that is pretty popular today, but back then it was really new. And uh, he said, can you handle that buffer? And I said, can I handle that buffer? Of course, I had never handled one of them, so I got it up on the altar, and it was hardwood flooring. It was very pretty hardwood flooring back then. And so I started that darn thing up, and I threw the switch, and when I did, that thing took off on me, and it was just going around and around. Up here, I'm holding it, and it was just going crazy. And he was hollering, turn it off, turn it off, Joe, turn it off. I said, unplug it, unplug it, because <laughs> I had to hold it up with both hands, and I couldn't turn loose to pull the switch. I said, unplug it, unplug it. Well, I think he aged about 10 years on that. I thought, really, I was going to get fired. Of course, he wasn't being paid anything. I was kind of hoping I'd get fired. It was interesting that Father Hannon, the Irishman, was sent here to be the pastor of the English Patron Church. They built over here, and when we transferred over here at 5.30 in the morning, we went every Sunday at 5.30. Father Hannon had a great task ahead of him. He had to mold this community spiritually and financially. We really worked back when this place was first started to pay for the old school and the church and everything. I was here helping with picnics back in the 40s, and late 40s and 50s, uh, even up to the time I was ordained, helping Father Hannon. We had a four-day picnic one time. I can see why they decided to go to Tithing. The St. Thomas More community lost its first pastor in 1954. And he died when they were building the, the sister's house and, the, and that over there. He died in Ireland. As people continued to move south of the downtown area, the church population expanded. The construction process on the grounds continued. Now, when I started here, they were using four classrooms. And by 1950, they were using 11, 12. That was just a small church in there, two little aisles, seats in there, maybe held a 100, 150 people, maybe. I can remember the old church. Uh, it would be standing room only. It would be packed. We had so many people coming to the masses. After the death of Father Hannon, Father Knorr came to the helm. He was known for his hands-on approach to leadership. 
I remember when the place got so big that I couldn't handle it by myself, and I went to Father Canoe, and I says, Father, I need another, I need a man to help me. I said, I can't, I can't uh, do it by myself anymore. It's just too much. He says, well, I can't give you a man. He said, I'll give you some teenage boys. And I said, oh, Father, I said, I'll have to teach them everything they know. He says, well, he says, somebody will have to teach them sometime or another. He says, you might as well teach some of them. Father Knorr initiated plans to build a new church. However, his death in 1961 didn't allow him to see the completion of the new church. With the plans only in the initial stages, Father J. William McCune came into the picture as Vatican II was about to begin. The Father McCune with the uh, new church was an example that this was far ahead of its time. And he wanted uh, the altar a certain way, so he, he created the altar himself. He designed it. He took a piece of soap and sculpted the way he wanted the altar to be. Father McCune, who was the pastor here at the time, had special windows uh, created in France. They came from Loire, France, and uh, very, very unusual, very different from the statue, the uh, stations that you see now. Each each window represents a station. He said to me, he says, Ed says, can we move that organ? Of course, that scared me to death. I didn't know nothing about organs. And he, he said, well, think about it. So a few days he says, have you thought about it? I said, well, yes, but I don't know whether we can or not. He says, well, he says, I'll take care of the, the pipes and you take care of the electrical stuff. But that's, that's one of the biggest things I think I ever tackled around here. The new church was just something unbelievable to us. We were so proud of it. Very impressive because the way you celebrate mass, I mean, you got people all around every side and uh, you can see everybody it's not a long cave like uh, going all the way to the street and uh, that's great to be have the personal contact almost with everyone father McCune's pastorate also created the groundwork for the way of life we now call stewardship we've been doing it for a long time as a form of tithing we haven't put the name tags on the the uh, time, talent, as well as the treasure, but uh, we've been doing it all down through the years. The many people that work to produce these buildings, that produce the, the uh, offspring that uh, they educated and raised as uh, Catholic people and produce the leaders of today and tomorrow. Father McCune left the parish in 1969. And he was transferred to St. Aloysius out at Pee Wee Valley. Uh, he could have stayed here because they had uh, found he had leukemia and only about six months to live. You know, he says, no, I don't want to stay there. He says, I don't want to die in that parish. Says, I'd rather be moved. So he was moved out there. And I think it was September he died. Father A.J. Swabington then became pastor of St. Thomas More. His leadership took the church through many changes because of Vatican II. Well, it used to be three or four priests out there, and now it's only one. And I don't know, it's just more so run by the people now than it is the priests. And Every person in the St. Thomas More community has the opportunity to touch others' lives. Everybody that I hear comes here say that it's a very warm community. St. Thomas More parishioners are friendly. They feel always welcome when they come here to church. There was times when I'd find boy being a smart aleck, you know. And I'd say, I like smart boys, but I just can't stand smart alecks. And uh, one in, in, uh, incident, a little while later, one of the boys that I talked to like that, he came back and apologized to me. One in particular that I'll always remember, and. Uh, and I'm sure you remember Father Chris Ryan, who was assistant pastor at the time. Uh, he came up to me one day and he said, uh, this is what we're gonna do for the Christmas program. And I looked at him, it was this big, thick book, Babes in Toyland, and I looked at him and I said, there's no way we're gonna be able to put that on. But knowing Chris Ryan, we did. When my wife was sick, 
She took care of us, I tell you. I'd uh, be kind of funny sometimes. I, I took up collection and things a lot in church. and <laughs> Start out, wife would get up and father. <laughs> And uh, that Susan Putman, she would just write out and get her, hold her hand. And she was so sweet. I think it's a message to everybody that you can do something here no matter who you are. I think in the church today, that's vitally important. As the creation of new life affected St. Thomas More, so did the death of another pastor. That afternoon, I was, went into the house for some reason to say something to him, and he said, well, Ed, this, he'd been waiting, it was kind of a bad spring, and he'd been waiting for a good day to go golfing. And he said, Ed, this is the day the Lord has made. And that was the last he ever said, I ever heard him say. Father Clifford Reedy succeeded Father Swabington in 1979. During his pastorate, RCIA, or the right of Christian initiation of adults was started. It was when I was uh, um, helping with the RCIA group. This process has spiritually influenced both those people that are inquiring about the Catholic faith and those assisting with the process. One of the teachers, middle school teachers at the time, one of my sons was going here, was conducting a phys ed class. Her, she was in her classroom and it was raining, they couldn't get outside, so she decided to have everyone stand up and do some exercises. And at the time, she had on a wraparound skirt and some cowboy boots. And she proceeded to do some, you know, toe touches and up. And then she did a jumping jack. And when she uh, landed, her skirt came untied and fell to the floor. <laughs> and her only comment, and she was a wise lady, was, thank goodness I wore a slip today. <laughs> we sold four boxes of candy. And they went to McDonald's in the limo. And I got to go along. The food fight. Coaching football at Tom Moore. Mother daughter basketball game. Eighth grade girls. And, I, and it was very embarrassing. Why is that? Because <laughs> I'm not very much of an athlete. But it was a lot of fun. But I'll never do it again. I get the flu every year on that night now. The school at St. Thomas More continues today to build on the strong traditions of the past. We've got a terrific uh, group of teachers now. We've had good teachers all along and uh, an excellent principal. And our enrollment is growing, which is something that, you know, a lot of the Catholic schools are not experiencing. We painted, <laughs> painted that school I don't know how many times in those 35 years I was around here. Our school uh, has a very good reputation too, and it uh, creates a, a, a welding of religious as well as educational opportunities. I'd be putting in a window out, you know, like standing on the ground, putting in the bottom window on the old church part there, and it was easy. And it'd be recess time or something like that. And these little kids, they'd all come up there, you know, and they'd watching what I was doing. And they'd get coming up so close that I couldn't move, and I'd say, hey, Y'all are going to have to back up a little, so give me room to do some work. They'd back up, you know, the first thing you know, they'd be back up to me. <laughs> but I enjoyed it. Everybody pitches in. We have very, very supporting families that support the church as well as the school. Father Don Fisher became pastor of St. Thomas More in 1981. He returned to the parish where he celebrated his first Mass. Under Father Fisher's leadership, the parish council was revised to allow the spirit of Vatican II to develop. Hopefully we can keep him around a little bit if he don't give us any more trouble. I'm talking about Father Fisher. If he gives us any trouble, we're going to move him on out here and get somebody in here, some young priest. I had a aneurysm burst. And uh, Father Fisher came up there at the hospital and He uh, gave me my last rites and stayed with me and so on. You know, I remember that. A church, a school, and a social outlet for most of the parishioners. We do like to have fun at St. Thomas More. 
I had a, a, a go-kart that it was made out of a bathtub that had, had legs on it, the old-fashioned cast iron go, uh, bathtub made into a go-kart. And uh, the sisters, oh, I wish I could think of their names. One was a tall, wonderful nun. But anyway, there was two of the sisters in their habits driving the go-kart toward my house, coming down the road, I mean flying. We were doing maybe 15, 20 mile an hour, maybe it looked like they were doing 100, because their habits were flying in the back. And, and it's one of the most beautiful pictures and scenes you'd ever see in your life, those two nuns driving that go-kart. The spring flings were always the big occasion, and of course the Christmas programs too. Uh, but the spring flings were, it was quite a production every uh, Showing year. up to take my, uh, the, the parish book picture in uh, shorts and a coat and tie. I mean, painting shorts. This was running across the yard, I'd like to show it to you. Look. Oh, it's a mouse. <laughs> it's a mouse. And his name is Elmer, why don't you pet him? Oh. Hey. I guess it was the day uh, Amy, our adopted daughter, was baptized. I don't know, I guess our 40th wedding anniversary. The people of St. Thomas More. Can we relate to our patron saint? Thomas More relates to, I think, our modern society because he was a, a father, he wasn't a priest. Uh, he was a father and a, a husband and a, a lawyer and finally the uh, the equivalent of Prime Minister of England, but a man who worked his way up from, from uh, childhood on into being very successful and all the time being Christian, thoroughly Catholic, and defending the church even to the very end of standing up against the king himself. It, uh, it's a person that can relate to our uh, society today because we have to stand up and face many obstacles that uh, threaten the faith and threaten the existence of the freedom that we have. And uh, so I think it's a good model for all of us. We have a lot of young parishioners that I think uh, have really helped to, to put new blood into the parish. And uh, I'm so grateful to see that. It's always rewarding to see the kids come along. They get, now they've got little kids. And, and you know, of course, I don't feel any older. I know I might look it, but I feel like I'm about 19 and uh, can still swing. <laughs> And so anyway, it's a real joy to come to church and see all of you. My most memorable was when I got married over here and my three sons were all baptized over here. The design of the new church and the introduction of the parish council selection process, as well as realizing our dream of establishing a network of communication to reach every household in our community, are only a few ways St. Thomas More has shown its vision placing us in front of the pack. Through the guidance of faith, the expression of hope, and the spirit of love, our future can continue to build on the great traditions of the past, and our parish can continue to grow as a great Catholic faith community. The history of St. Thomas More cannot properly be told in 20 minutes. There are many more people and many, many more stories. However, we would like to thank those we did interview. Bill Eiler, Merle Watson, Carolyn Kennedy, Ed Goody, and Father Don Fisher. Special thanks also goes to Julie Robertson, who helped produce this video. Finally, I, Tim Crook, the creator of this video, would like to dedicate it to the memory of my mother, a longtime parishioner of St. Thomas More, Ann Crook. In her honor, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. One final statement, according to our deacon, Mike Talbert. God bless.